Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm sorry that that I couldn't be there, but uh, you know this is uh, this is good. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, okay, so so let me begin. Uh, so um, so spin glasses, you know, uh, if you are not familiar, uh, these are magnetic materials with some strange properties and. Uh, and some common materials that exhibit spin glass behavior include, uh, you know, certain types of alloys, um, uh, such as these, and certain types of glasses and ceramics. So I got this from Chat GPT actually. Uh, and um, uh, and one of the characteristic properties is the position of multiple states with near minimal energy. So unlike uh, ferromagnets, which have a very well defined minimum energy state. Uh, there are many near minimal energy states which are competing with each other, which makes uh, the dynamics of this of spin glass mixing very slow uh, and there are other consequences. Uh, mathematical models of spin glasses have proved to be very difficult to analyze, uh, perhaps reflecting these complexities of the materials. And it has been an active area in um, mathematical physics and probability to analyze these, uh, these models. So what are spin glass models? Uh, they are they generally fall into two categories, mean field models, such as the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, or the more realistic lattice models, such as the Edwards Anderson model. And uh, realistic means that, you know, physicists say these are more realistic than the mean field models. Um, and um, so they have lattice interactions instead of, you know, every spin interacting with every other, the, the spins only interact with nearby spins. Now for mean field models, uh, tremendous progress has been made uh, over the last 30 years. This is you know, some highlights are in Telegram's proof of the Parisi formula or Panchenko's proof of altrametricity. The Edwards-Anderson model on the other hand um, and other models of spin glass and lattice remain largely intractable. So we don't really know how to do um, much or anything about these models essentially. And even physicists are not unanimous about the true nature of lattice spin glass models. And I'll come to the reason behind that, you know, why they're not unanimous. Uh, so, so it's not clear, you know, what we should aim to prove or disprove. So usually, you know, physicists have a very clear answer and then uh, mathematicians try to prove um, that. But here, even the right answer is not given to us. It's not clear what, what the right answer should be. So here's the Edwards Anderson model. Uh, and um, one can do it on a general graph, but let's just consider a subset of the lattice. So you take any dimension D and any L and you let, consider this cube, zero, one up to L to the power of D. And let E be the set of nearest neighbor edges uh, of V. And let J be a collection of ID random variables, which we take to be standard Gaussian in the stock. So, you know, there are other choices also, but for in the stock, we'll just take them to standard Gaussian. Um, the Edwards Anderson, Anderson Hamiltonian with free boundary condition in this environment J is defined as this function, HJ of sigma. So sigma is a configuration of spins, one spin, spin at each vertex in this set V. Uh, and it has energy summation J, I, J, sigma, I, sigma, J, where I, J are edges, nearest neighbor edges. Okay, so it's a very simple form. It's, uh, if you're familiar with the easing model, it's just the easing model, but with the, a couplings, uh, you know, which are all plus one for the easing model, you replace them with a random a plus or minus, uh, you know, positive or negative couplings. And a ground state is a state sigma depending on this disorder or environment J that minimizes this Hamiltonian. And, you know, in the case of continuous um, uh, disorder, so standard Gaussian, for example, uh, one nice thing is that with probability one, there are exactly two ground state sigma and minus sigma. And this pair is called the unique ground state pair. And we can also consider some given boundary condition that doesn't depend on J. So we can put some boundary condition on the, on the box, which means that we fix the spins on the boundary, um, in which case there is exactly one ground state. Or we can consider the periodic boundary condition, which, are, uh, which identifies opposite faces of V. So these are all mm, different kinds of boundary conditions. So is the is the model clear? Is the Hamiltonian clear? What? Any questions so far? Okay. So please stop me for questions anytime. Uh, you know, there's a certain cost in that in you know, getting the mic, but uh, in any case. So um, okay. So what are, what do we know? 
about the ground state. Uh, Eisenman and Ware in 1990 proved that the fluctuations of the ground state energy are of the order uh, square root of the volume. So they get, got both upper and lower bounds. That's one thing we know. Um, a standard approach in mathematical physics is to consider infinite volume ground states. So you take L equals infinity. And of course, if you take L equals infinity, the notion of minimizing the energy no longer makes sense uh, in infinite volume, but because of energy itself, is not uh, well defined. This, uh, the sum is not convergent, but the difference between the energies of two states that differ, that differ only at a finite number of sites that is well defined and finite. Okay, so we can always talk about differences of energies between two states that differ only at finitely many sites. An infinite volume state is called a ground state if overturning any finite number of spins results in an increase in the energy. So infinite volume usually it's taken well L equal to infinity is not the you know not completely accurate what is happening here is you taking taking the full ZD so the full lattice and so you have on each edge of the lattice you have a Gaussian random variable and then you look at a state um, you know look at a configuration of spins in the infinite volume on the full ZD and you say that it's a ground state if overturning any finite number of spins results in an increase in the energy. So it's a local optimum. Um, Eisenman and Ware proved that one can construct a measurable map that takes the environment, the full disorder, to a probability measure on the set of ground states. Okay, so there is a set of ground states for for a given disorder, um, and then uh, Eisenman and Ware showed that you can construct a measurable map that takes the environment to a probability measure on the set of ground states. Such a map is called a meta state in this literature. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so for the last 30 years, um, there are not many papers, but whatever there is, um, it the mathematical literature concentrates mainly on the Edwards-Anderson model uh, on, on the study of these metastates. And one of the main goals has been to show this. So what people have been trying to show is that in two dimensions, there is exactly one ground state pair in infinite volume with probability one. So just like in the easing model. The easing model, if you consider infinite volume, um, and um, you know you can consider uh, this um, just this one ground state pair. Uh, so just like that, um, uh, you know, in um, uh, in the in the in this uh, Edwards-Anderson model, also in two D, there is a conjecture that um, that there is exactly with probability one, there is exactly one ground state pair. Uh, and uh, but physicists are not unanimous about this, so it's not completely sure that this is this is true or not. So one result, one definite result that exists is that using the result of Newman and Stein, uh, these four authors, Argan, Damron, Newman, Newman and Stein, prove that a certain meta state on the half plane, uh, so not all ground states, but if you consider a certain meta state, is supported in a unique ground state pair with probability one. Okay, so there is, uh, but it's on a half plane, not on the full Z2. So that's one result that exists. And there are several other results of this flavor, but this is more or less a state of the art in this area. In other words, there is very little that we rigorously understand about the Edwards-Anderson model. And in particular, one thing that's completely open that there is no proof that this model exhibits any kind of spin glass behavior that is different than a ferromagnet. So, so we don't know how to prove that there is a phase transition or any marker of spin glass type behavior. Um, we don't know that this is actually um, a valid spin glass model. I mean, in the sense of rigorous math. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So, um, so what is the marker of spin glass behavior? Uh, consider the uh, icing ferromagnet uh, on the lattice, where gij equals one for every edge. Every edge. Uh, let's consider you know free boundary conditions. Uh, the ground state pair uh, is sigma minus sigma, where either all the spins are plus one or all the spins are minus one. That's the ground state pair. Now you take a region A in uh, this uh, vertex set whose size is of order L to the D. So it's a macroscopic region. And suppose we overturn all the spins in A. So, so overturn is uh, you know, a physics term. Uh, we, we usually say flip all the spins, but it's, uh, you know, somehow it sounds, maybe it sounds nicer. Uh, so uh, we overturn all the spins in A in the ground state. Then this increases the energy. It must increase the energy because we are in the ground state. So it increases the energy. And what's the increase? It's exactly the size of this uh, edge boundary. So the set of all edges from A to the to its complement. Okay. So that's the increase in the energy. 
What Frizzles tell us that in spin glasses, it's possible to overturn a macroscopic region of spins with energy cost that is very small, negligible compared to the size of the boundary. And this is a multiple valley picture for the Edwards Anderson model. And th there are some conjectures about how small it is. So it is possible to overturn a region and you get the energy increase is not the not proportional to the uh, size of the interface, but much smaller than it. And so how small there are competing claims. These are made by numerical studies that, for example, in three dimensions, the energy cost is sometimes conjectured to be as small as L to the one fifth, or even smaller than that order one doesn't even depend on L. Uh, note that um, the boundary, if you take a macroscopic region, the boundary is at least of order L squared. It may be larger if it's a fractal boundary, but it has to be at least of order L squared. So it's much smaller than that. That's what's conjectured. The main difficulty in the simulations is that this found, finding this ground state is an NP hard problem. As far as I know, there are no good algorithms for doing this. It really takes a long time. And, um, and for example, in this paper, 2001, uh, L was taken to be 12. And I think it's probably very hard to differentiate between these two with L equals 12. Uh, but, uh, but there are, uh, you know, conjectures and maybe now you can do it somewhat larger L, but nothing so de definitive that uh, an answer, answer has been reached. Okay. Uh, because you see already with 12, uh, the number of uh, grid points is 12 cubed. And so the number of states is two to the power of 12, 12 cubed. Okay, so unless there are good algorithms uh, for that, you know, uh, if you are forced to do some kind of grid search, because you really have to know the exact ground state for answering this kind of question. You ca cannot do it approximate uh, states. And I don't think there are even algorithms, good algorithms for approximate states. Okay, so th these are some of the difficulties. Now, uh, so this, this phenomenon that the faces claim is true, uh, the, the physics explanation for the existence of low energy excitations of these spin glasses simply, you know, they say it's cancellations. Uh, but this is not, um, okay, so you can imagine that, okay, so you have this uh, boundary and in the easing spin glass, uh, as easing model, you, if you overturn, you, you get plus one contributions from the boundary, uh, but here you have GIGs, so you can expect some cancellations, but that's not really, um, enough. So a few years ago, I proved this, but I did not publish. It's coming up in a forthcoming paper, uh, that if you take a typical region, A, uh, so there are positive constants C1, C2, and C3, depending only on dimension, so that if you take a typical region and you look at the energy cost of overturning all spins in A, and the ratio of the uh, size of the boundary, the ratio of that to the size of the boundary, the chance that it's less than a positive constant C1 is exponentially small in the size of the boundary. So for large regions, it's extremely unlikely that this ratio is small, it's smaller than a constant. Okay. So, so it's not true for typical regions. Okay, for, so, so for every region, this ratio is, of, of course, it's positive because overturning spins always increases, but for a typical region, and so, so you can, of course, then take union bounds over many regions. And um, uh, so thus for a given region A, overturning the spins in A incurs an energy cost of, or, of the order of the size of the boundary with probability extremely close to one, just like in ferromagnets. So even if this multiple value picture holds, it only holds for exceptional regions of overturned spins. And given this theorem, it's not unbelievable that this, these actually don't exist. And uh, you know, given that, the simulations have done with not very large L, um, one can believe that maybe maybe they don't exist. So, so it's an exponentially small probability. And so if the number of regions, number of contours that you can get uh, somehow cannot beat that exponentially small quantity that you that you got, um, you, you are done. You, you know that such regions don't, don't exist. And so I spent several years fruitlessly trying to prove and occasionally trying to disprove that such regions don't exist. Uh, but very recently over the winter break, uh, I realized how to prove that they do exist. So here is the theorem. Um, take any D and L, okay? let V be this region. Let F be the minimum of this ratio, the cost of overturning all the spins in a region divided by the boundary of this region over all sets A, which are macroscopic. I just took some arbitrary um, bounds. So like at least one fourth the volume of this region and at most three fourths the volume of this region. You took, take the minimum of all this. And, uh, and then for any given boundary condition, I can show that this expected value of this quantity 
is small. It's like L to the minus one fourth if D is one, L to the minus one third if D is two or higher. And for periodic boundary, it's slightly improved. Okay. So this is one of the results that I can prove. And I'll give you a sketch of the proof, um, more or less a complete sketch of the proof. I think I, I'll have time for that. Okay. Any questions about this? So that's the first theorem. It's not, it's not an archive yet, it'll be soon uh, within this week, maybe. So, um, so this is the first proof of spin glass behavior of any kind in the edwards anderson model. So, uh, so there is no other result that um, uh, says the, this model behaves like a spin glass in any way. Um, so the second thing is uh, this disorder chaos. So another physics conjecture about the ground state is that it's sensitive to small changes in disorder, a phenomenon that's called disorder chaos. Uh, so let us consider two kinds of perturbations, both determined by a parameter P in zero one. One is that we replace each coupling by one minus P times JE plus square root two P minus P squared times JE prime, where these are independent standard Gaussian variables. And these coefficients are chosen so that they, their squares sum up to one. Uh, so that so the linear combination, linear combination is again a Gaussian variable. So this is a standard kind of Gaussian interpolation. And the second kind of perturbation, each uh, variable is replaced by an independent copy with probability P independently of each other. Okay. So in both cases, if P is small, the perturbation is small. Okay. In the first case, the coupling, each coupling changes a little, but not much. In second case, a small fraction of couplings are replaced by independent copies. Okay. So let sigma be the ground state in the original environment and sigma prime be the ground state in the perturbed environment. The site overlap is just this. It's the average of sigma i sigma i prime over all vertices. That's the site overlap between two configurations. The site overlap is said to be chaotic with respect to perturbations of the disorder if this becomes close to zero with high probability from, for some P that is close to zero. Okay. Uh, so disorder chaos in this model was first conjectured by Fisher and Hughes and Bray and Moore uh, long ago and verified in various numerical studies since then. And there is no um, uh, rigorous proof until now. So here is the theorem that I have. So, uh, so given, uh, Again, V like this, uh, for both kinds of perturbations, we have that for all P, the expected overlap squared uh, is bounded by one over LP if D is one, one over L squared P squared if D is two or bigger. And for free or periodic boundary conditions, this improves to one over L to the D, P to the D for every D. And thus uh, this overlap is close to zero with high probability as long as P is much bigger than one over L. So I don't know if this is the correct threshold, maybe it's smaller. So I have to check in the physics literature exactly. I think, I think they say it's smaller, but at least, you know, for small P, you, you get um, that the ground state becomes nearly orthogonal, to the one that uh, was there originally. Okay. Okay, so let me now go into the proof. Uh, so in the physics literature, usually the multiple value picture is taken as a given, and then chaos is argued to be a consequence of multiple values. Uh, but I'll go in the opposite direction by first proving that this, uh, this system is chaotic and then deducing the multiple value picture as a consequence of this um, chaos. Okay, so, uh, so let H0, H1, uh, H2, et cetera, be the orthonormal basis of normalized Hermit polynomials. Uh, for the L2 uh, space of the standard Gaussian measure on the real line with starting with H0 identically equal to one. Okay. So then, then an orthonormal basis for L2 of, of all the couplings is formed by products like this. So these are multivariate orthogonal uh, her hermit polynomials. So they're indexed by, um, you know, tuples of non-negative integers. So for each edge of a non-negative integer, n e, which is zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And then you apply h n e to j e and you take the product over all edges e. That's the, that's the multivariate uh, ortho, uh, Hermit polynomial. And these polynomials, they form a basis of L2 of j, okay? Now, any square function of the disorder can be represented in this basis as this infinite sum 
overall coefficients of f hat n times h n of j, some linear combination of these multivariate Hermit polynomials, where f hat n is uh, obtained by this nice formula, is the expectation of f j and h n multiplied with h n of j. So it's just a Hilbert space thing that you take the inner product of the function with the uh, with the basis element and you take, take put the basis element and the coefficients here. And the sum uh, is, uh, it should be interpreted as an L2 limit of partial sums where the order of summation is irrelevant. Okay. So this is the uh, Hermit polynomial expansion or chaos expansion uh, for uh, functions of Gaussian random variables. Okay, so now taking a distinct i and j, taking distinct sites in this uh, set V, let sigma be the ground state. So it may be that there are two ground states, sigma and minus sigma, but in any case, sigma i times sigma j is the same for both ground states. So this is a well-defined function of the disorder. So if you take the disorder j, sigma i times sigma j is a function of the disorder. So call it phi j. Now you take this function uh, phi j, um, and now you look at this, the Fourier coefficients, uh, the, um, the coefficients of the function in the Hermit polynomial basis. So for any n indexing the Hermit polynomial, so you take uh, you know, tuples of um, uh, non-negative integers, one for each edge, and for any such n, let E n be the set of edges E so that n E is positive. And uh, let Vn be the set of vertices that are endpoints of the edges in Em. And let, let Gn be the graph Vn comma Em. Okay. So it's a subgraph of our original graph. So you take a subset of vertices, you take a subset of edges. And these edges are the precisely those edges for, N, for which Ne is positive. So the following lemma is the main ingredient in the proof of chaos and then the proof of the multiple value picture. Uh, so let all uh, notations be as above, then this Fourier coefficient is zero unless both i and j are in this Vn vertex set Vn and the connected components of Gn containing i and j are either the same or they both intersect the boundary in case we have a boundary condition. So if we don't have a boundary condition, we just stop here. So this is zero unless both i and j are, are uh, in this Vn and um, they are in the same connected component of this graph Gn. Okay, so phi is the function that takes the disorder to the product of these two spins, sigma i, sigma j. Any questions about this? So I'll sketch the proof of this in the next slide. It's uh, uh, Saro, can you hear? Yeah. Uh, one, why is it as a function, it doesn't depend on the ground state? Sigma i, sigma j? No oh. Matter. Uh, oh, so so if you have a boundary condition, then we are only considering finite volume. So if you have a boundary condition, then there is a unique ground state. So of course uh, it's uh, well defined. If you don't have a boundary condition, if a free or periodic boundary, then there are with probability one there are exactly two ground states, sigma and minus sigma. And so in both cases, sigma and sigma times sigma g is the same. Okay, so so it's it's well defined. So uh, this is one place where the continuous disorder comes into play. If you don't have a continuous disorder, then there can be different ground states. But uh, this is finite volume with continuous disorder. So with probability one, you can have at most these two ground states, sigma and minus sigma. Okay, is the, was that clear? Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so you have this lemma. So how do you prove this lemma? Uh, so for simplicity, consider the case of free boundary. And the lemma says two things. One is that i and j must be in Vn and the connected component uh, of uh, g and containing i and j are either the same or they both intersect the boundary. So we are taking free boundary, so there's no boundary. And also for simplicity, assume that i and j are in Vn. So that, that requires a little bit of an extra argument to show that i and j and v are in Vn. But the main thing is that they, are, they must belong to the same connected component of this graph. So suppose not, then there is a contour separating the components containing i and j, such that no edge in this contour is in the edge set En. So remember, En is a set of all edges where n e is positive. So n is a particular index for the Hermit polynomial in the Hermit polynomial expansion. Okay. So suppose we replace j e by minus j e for each edge in this contour. 
this changes the sigma i sigma j to minus sigma i sigma j. So if you have a contour and you replace all the edge the couplings by by the negatives, the ground state just becomes you know you can either outside that contour you can make it all the negative of the original one, or inside you can change it all to negative. Both of these will give you the new ground state. And um, and then you see that the sigma i sigma j change, changes to minus sigma i sigma j. This shows that the expected value of sigma i sigma j given all the couplings outside this contour is the same as the expected value of minus sigma i sigma j given the, all the couplings outside this contour because just replacing j by minus j inside this contour changes sigma i sigma j to minus sigma i sigma j, which shows that the expected value of sigma i sigma j given all the spins outside this contour is zero. But this Hermit polynomial H and J does not depend on the couplings inside the contour because the contour separates two components. So the contour has no edge, which is in, um, is in EN. So you can take this phi hat N, which is this expectation, and you can replace this sigma I sigma J by its conditional expectation given all the J is outside gamma, and you can take the H and J outside because it has no dependence. It's a function of these couplings, okay? And so this inner thing becomes zero, and so the whole thing becomes zero. So you have that uh, the this Fourier coefficient vanishes. Okay. Any questions about this proof? So so the main consequence of the lemma is the following. Uh, so I'll recall the whole setup for you. We have fixed some i j in the vertex set v. You consider sigma i sigma j as a function of the disorder. For an index n, uh, which is indexing the elements of the Hermit polynomial expansion, uh, phi hat n denotes the coefficient of h n j in the Hermit polynomial expansion of phi j. For each n, e n denotes a set of all e so that n e is positive and v n is a set of n points of these edges. The lemma shows that this phi hat n is zero unless both i and g are in vn and the connected components of gn containing i and g are either the same or they both intersect the boundary of the, if there is a boundary condition. Now, the main consequence is that from this, we conclude that the size of the edge set should be at least the minimum of these two things. It should at least contain in the first case, if i and g are in the same connected component of this graph, the number of um, edges, uh, you know, in this graph should be at least the distance between i and j. Or if the second thing happens that the both components intersect the boundary, there should be the sum of these two things, the distance of i from the boundary and the distance plus the distance of j from the boundary. So, so it gives a lower bound in the number of edges contained in this graph, or in other words, the number of edges e so that n e is positive. So that's the main conclusion that the Hermit polynomial expansion of sigma i sigma j consists only of terms that are products of at least a certain number of elements of univariate Hermit polynomials. If the two, point, two vertices i and g are far apart, and they're also both far away from the boundary, then the Hermit polynomial expansion can only con contain very high degree terms. The, it cannot contain low degree terms as a function of the disorder. So it's a very complicated function of the disorder, which I don't know what it is. But from the structure of the problem and using the symmetries of the problem, uh, I have been able to show here that uh, it has to be very high degree if the vertices are far away from each other and far away from the boundary. Okay, okay. so how does this help? It helps us prove chaos and maybe now many of you can already see uh, you know, what's the proof of chaos since uh, we have been able to show that the Hermit polynomial expansion only contains high degree terms. Uh, but let me still uh, walk you through that. Uh, let JP be obtained from J by applying a perturbation of size P of either kind. Then for any E and N, the expectation of H N J E of P given J E is this. For the perturbation of first kind, you can show in the, I'm skipping this. You can show that this is one minus P to the N H N of J E and one minus P times H N of J for the perturbation of the second kind. So for any, uh, you know, multi-index expectation of H n of J p given J is H n of J times this coefficient for the perturbation of first kind and H n of J times this other coefficient for the perturbation of the second kind where the first coefficient is one minus P to, uh, to the power of summation of all the N E's and in the second case, one minus P to the size of this edge set where this is just a number of N E's that are positive. Okay. 
And this shows that if you take the ground state after, after the perturbation, uh, this conditional expectation of sigma i p sigma j p given the original disorder is just phi at n times h n expectation of h n of j p given j, which is just becomes this sum. Okay, so it's the original sum phi hat n times h n of j, but each term is multiplied by a coefficient, and these are the coefficients. But we know that whenever phi hat n is non-zero, uh, this sum, the sum of the n's as well as the edge uh, size of the edge set. These are both bounded below by um, this quantity m, which is the minimum of the distance between i and j and the distance between i to the boundary plus the distance of j to the boundary. And therefore, by the passable identity for the Hermit polynomial expansion, we have that the L2 norm squared of this conditional expectation uh, is bounded above by 1 minus p to the 2m times the sum over all n, phi hat n squared, but phi, so this sum is just expectation of sigma i sigma j squared, which is just exactly equal to one. Okay. Any questions about this? So, so then finally, if you take sigma i sigma j in the original environment times sigma i p sigma j p in the new environment, this expectation absolute value can be written as you know expectation of sigma i sigma j times this conditional expectation, which you can take the absolute value inside and bound by this state that's bounded by the square root of the L2 norm. And combining all of that, we find this, uh, which gives a mathematical proof of this observation from long ago that relative orientations of spins with large separations are sensitive to small changes in the bond strengths. So if you take two spins uh, far apart uh, and you slightly perturb the bond strengths, the relative orientation of the two spins uh, is, um, uh, is chaotic with respect to that. Okay. So this, uh, this proves that. And it's now easy to complete the proof of chaos because the overlap squared is just an average of quantities like this. Okay, so you can... You can take the expectation on both sides and apply this and then do some calculations, get the result. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, so how do you go from chaos to multiple values? Uh, let A be the region that's overturned when we apply a perturbation of uh, the first kind of size P where P is much bigger than one over L and much smaller than one. By the chaos theorem, we know that the overlap is close to zero, which means that the overturned region has a size approximately the volume divided by two. And we'll show that this region works. We'll show that the cost of overturning the spins in A is negligible compared to the size of A. So the, the perturbation is just a way of getting at this result. The result itself has nothing to do with perturbations. The result says that you know, there is a region A so that the cost of overturning all the spins in A is negligible compared to the size of the boundary. And, uh, and the way we find the set A is like this, giving a perturbation and look at how, where the spins change when you perturb the system. Okay. So, so here's the argument. Since sigma P minimizes the new Hamiltonian, uh, HJP, the perturbed Hamiltonian, HJP of sigma minus HJP of sigma P is bigger than or equal to zero because sigma P is minimizing HJP. But on the other hand, the same quantity can also be written like this. It's minus two times j i j p sigma i sigma j over all i j in the boundary of A. A is the region of overturned spins. And then j i j p has an explicit form. It's one minus p times j i j plus square root two p minus p squared times j i j prime. But this first quantity is just uh, h j of sigma p minus h j of sigma. So it's the cost of overturning all the spins in A uh, in the original environment. So this minus this is bigger than or equal to zero. And so you, if you rearrange the terms, you get that this cost of overturning the spins is at most, uh, you know, this quantity divided by one minus P, which is like a constant times square root P. And this is bounded by the size of the boundary times the maximum of these couplings. Okay, and these are Gaussians. So the maximum of the couplings is at most of the order square root log L. And so we can now take P to be some suitable negative power of L to ensure that it's bigger than L inverse and you can get this to get the result. Okay. Any questions about this?
Okay. So uh, what are some of the open questions? Uh, so in the preprint, I'll have some, some more results, but these are the main, main ones. Uh, uh, so there are many open questions, but the most important one is the following. Uh, in three dimensions, does there exist a macroscopic region where the spins in the ground state can be overturned with an energy cost of order one as L goes to infinity? So, so I have a much worse thing than that, but uh, the physicists say that there is a ground state there, maybe. So there is, well, if true, this would support what's called a Parisi picture of lattice spin glasses. So Parisi has a certain, uh, you know, certain set of conjectures about uh, spin glasses in the lattice. And if false, if the minimum energy cost grows with L, that would support this uh, droplet theory of Fisher and Hughes. And this, uh, uh, this validity of this versus droplet theory is, uh, uh, is arguably the most important question about these lattice uh, spin glasses. Uh, at at present, and uh, you know, uh, so that that would clarify a lot of things if uh, if one can establish this. Uh, a related question, uh, which is closely related to this problem, is that we have seen that this conditional expectation of the product of the spins at sites i and j, conditional on the original environment, drops sharply to zero as p increases from zero to a small positive value if i and j are far apart. Okay, that was the foundation of all the results that I showed you. But suppose now that I and G are neighbors, then one can show that this conditional expectation does not drop to zero, but the question is, does it drop sharply to a value less than one? So to put it more uh, you know, rigorously, uh, is it true that under a periodic boundary condition for neighboring I and G, so I say periodic because then you have to don't say where is I and G. So if you just say neighboring I and G, that's enough. It's a, this, this expectation is the same for all neighboring. So you can work under periodic boundary conditions. For neighboring I and G, this, this conditional expectation squared, take the expectation of that, the size of this, the L2 norm squared of this conditional expectation, you first send L to infinity, fixing P, and then send P to zero. So if you do that, is the limit strictly less than one? Okay. Because if you first send P to zero, of course, this will go to one. But if you first send L to infinity and then send P to zero, there's a chance that it may be less than one. So this would again settle this controversy, uh, the space picture versus the droplet theory and whether they're incongruent states, uh, et cetera. So, so if this is less than one, that would support what Parisi has been conjecturing. And if, if it is equal to one, that would give support to the droplet theory. Okay, okay so, uh, so that's all I had to say and I'm stopping a little early. Uh, thank you. <laughs>